All right, we're going to take a look at a number of things that waves do, what we collectively call wave phenomena. And these are particularly important because it helps us identify waves. We'll talk later on in the year about how recognizing that light does these things helped us realize that light was a wave. And these are things that all waves do, whether they're sound waves, water waves, light waves. Sometimes it's hard to see these manifest without, you know, kind of a fancy setup. But all waves will exhibit these phenomena. So they're like the telltale signs that what you're observing is a wave. First thing we're going to look at is um, reflection of waves. So let me pull up wonderful FET applet here. So if you go here, FET.colorado.edu, you can play with this. Uh, you have a different number of settings, but I'm just going to look at one single pulse. And if you have like an infinitely long string and you shake one end of it, you will send a pulse down. I'm going to lower the tension a little bit so that doesn't fly by quite so quickly. All right, so we can send a pulse, continues out the window forever. Now if we have a fixed end, got it clamped down here, Obviously, it's not going to fly out the window. What happens is it reflects back. And as you notice, the wave gets inverted. Uh, essentially, because of Newton's third law, this wave pulls up on the string, or sorry, the wave pulls up on the clamp when it hits the end of the string. So the clamp pulls down on the string as a reaction to that and sends a pulse in the other direction. Uh, if we have a loose end, then there's nothing to pull down on the string, but the wave still gets reflected, it just doesn't get inverted. Now this end is still fixed, so we get inverted here, but not inverted there. All right, so that's the first property, uh, just the idea that waves will reflect. Okay, <clears throat> and if you have a whole bunch of waves, so imagine these is a bunch of water waves striking the shore, these lines here, and they're moving in this way in the direction of the red lines. When they hit the shore, they will bounce off and head out in this direction. So these blue lines here will be heading off in this direction. And we have what we call the law of reflection, which says that the incident, which is a fancy word for the incoming angle, that will equal the reflected or the outgoing angle. So these theta i equals theta r here. And that's the law of reflection. Okay. Um, another situation, another phenomenon of waves is what we call wave transmission. Uh, I think I have to click off my pen for these animations to work. So let's see. There we go. So in this case, I've got an incoming wave, and the idea here is if you've got like a string attached to a rope, or the medium changes, it gets thicker. So you can get a reflected wave at that boundary, and you also get one that passes through, and we call that a transmitted wave. So a transmitted wave is just when you have a wave transfer from one medium to another. The one that goes into the new medium is called the transmitted wave. You'll notice over here we're going from thick rope to thin rope and we also get a transmitted wave but we <clears throat> the reflected wave is not inverted whereas this one is for similar reasons we saw in that previous demonstration where this string is lighter so it's able to move more, this one's heavier so it exerts a downward force on it. There's other cool things here. You'll notice this one goes faster <clears throat> that can be due to conservation of momentum. If this guy bounces back, <clears throat> this guy has to go faster, just like a bowling ball running into a ping pong ball. Also, you'll notice that the waves decrease in amplitude because uh, a demonstration of conservation of energy. So there's a lot of good principles going on here. Okay, the next phenomenon we're going to look at is what we call interference. And uh, this one uh, we're going to deal with quite a bit. This is what happens when two waves uh, interact with each other. So the idea here is if you've got a, a crest moving to the right and a trough moving to the left, uh, if they're exactly the same amplitude, there will be a moment in, and, and width as well, the same wavelength and amplitude, uh, there will be a moment in time when they completely cancel each other out, and then a little bit later they will keep going like they had never met. And we call this <clears throat> destructive interference if they cancel out. So destructive crest meets trough, 
these are both types of interference. Constructive, if we have a crest meeting a crest, rather than canceling each other out, they will build up into a larger pulse momentarily, then they will pass through each other and continue on their merry ways like they had never met. We call this idea of adding waves, where the waves can have positive and negative magnitude, we call that superposition. So the combined amplitude uh, is just the uh, <clears throat> additive sum of the two, I guess additive sum is redundant. Anyway, the sum of the amplitudes of the two waves. Okay, so <clears throat> another demonstration of what's going on. So the waves don't have to be exactly the same size. You just take whatever sizes they are and add up the waves at each individual point. Let me see if I can turn my pen on and freeze this guy. There we go. So if you add up the height of the blue wave here and the height of the red wave here, that will give you that height. Here there's not much blue wave to add. Here you got that red wave and blue wave. So you just sum the two waves and you will get the resultant height. All right, now I don't have a little animation for destructive interference, so let's, uh, let's pull up our little FET applet again here. <clears throat> so if I send one pulse, um, let's, let's do a fixed end, it doesn't really matter. So I'll send one pulse down, and then if I wait a minute, I'm going to send another pulse, then they can cancel out momentarily. Let's slow this down. So for a split instant there, there is no uh, wave whatsoever. Now if we said waves are carrying energy, we're, <clears throat> we're carrying energy in two different directions. Uh, and what happens when they cancel out? Is the energy gone for a second? Well, no. Uh, when the string is stretched, you have elastic potential energy, but then you also have some kinetic energy from the motion. And when they cancel out, it's momentarily at equilibrium, but it's still moving. So it's got all kinetic energy at the instant it cancels out. And again, it doesn't have to be um, identical waves. If you want to cancel completely, they need to be identical waves, but inverted. But you can have partial cancellation. Let's take it off slow for a second. So we got this wave, and then let's make, let's make like a shorter, fatter wave. And we'll send this guy out. Maybe that guy was too short and fat, but let's look at slow-mo here. So we've got a short fat wave. This guy shortens a little bit when they're meeting, but we would still call that constructive if they cancel out a little bit or completely. We would call it constructive if they add up uh, whether they're identical or not. Okay. Uh, now, this idea of interference combined with reflection leads to another, not a phenomenon, but another thing we're going to study, which is called standing waves. Okay, so what's going on here is there's a reflected wave going back and it's interfering uh, with the incoming wave. So there's still a wave constantly being produced and traveling to the right. And then eventually we, uh, we reach this stable state where we've got a, a wave reflected to the left, interfering with a wave reflected to the right. And so we get a wave that doesn't move left or right. It's just standing there. Let me show you one other picture of that. And whether it's fixed or loose doesn't really make a difference. It changes the phase of things, but you still get a standing wave pattern. Okay, one more animation here. This kind of shows um, two waves meeting, one coming from the right and one coming from the left. So the blue and the red up here are showing you the two waves. And then this is the interference pattern or the addition of the two waves. So you'll notice when you get um, a crest lining up with a crest, that's when you get this nice constructive interference. And then when you have a crest lined up with a trough, come back again. Let's wait for it to establish for a second. So when you've got crest with trough, that's when it's all canceled out. And uh, so you get standing waves patter wave patterns. And these are really important for, um, for what we call resonance, uh, things in, in musical instruments and whatnot. Uh, it's these standing wave patterns that tend to produce the sounds that we hear. And you can get standing wave patterns with longitudinal waves as well as um, trans, 
Tran transverse. Sorry, forgot my terminology there for a second. So this is kind of the idea of what it would look like, where you have areas where it's not going up and or back and forth here, areas that are stationary, and then areas where they're sloshing back and forth. So you can get standing waves in either case. Um, let me jump back to this for a second uh, and try to pause it once we get a good wave here. All right. Now, you'll notice these locations here never move, and then this guy is oscillating up and down. These locations where it's not moving, uh, we, call those, we call those locations nodes. So here, here, wherever, it's always at equilibrium. The other places where we have oscillating crests and troughs, we call those anti-nodes. Okay, so that would be here, here, here. Nodes and anti-nodes. Anti-nodes means it's moving a lot. <laughs> nodes is where it's stationary. And you'd have the same thing on your, uh, on your longitudinal wave here. Uh, these would be the nodes where it's not moving. Here in the middle where you have maximum movement would be considered the anti-nodes. Okay, now we can get <clears throat> even more complicated interference patterns. Let me pull up a different thing here. This is called a ripple tank. And uh, let me clear this. So imagine you have just like water dripping into, um, into your sink, and your sink is full of water. You would get this ripple effect of, of spherical, not, well, circular waves propagating out. And uh, if I have... I can do 3D view here too, so we get something that looks like this. So we get these cool wave patterns. Now this is an interference, but if I get more than one source, so I've got, let me clear this for a second, so I've got two faucets dripping into the same sink. Now these waves are going to strike each other, and at certain points they will interfere constructively, and other points they will interfere destructively. So these kind of gray lines in here are destructive interference, and these peaks are constructive interference. Uh, Two-dimensional view would look something like this. So these are the uh, destructive interference lines here. So you can get, you can get some pretty cool patterns. Uh, let me show you four sources. Uh, clear this for a second. There was actually a fountain in one of the buildings uh, where I went to college, and it had four spouts that were just kind of dribbling water out. And whenever I'd walk by, I would look, and you would see this pattern very distinctly in the water. Uh, it was really cool. So you get all kinds of constructive and destructive interferences overlapping. And here's the uh, two-dimensional view. So anyway, you, you can do some pretty cool things with constructive and destructive interference. Uh, this is also important in uh, noise cancellation technology. You've seen those noise-canceling headphones. Essentially what they do is they read in an incoming wave and they produce a wave that is inverted and play that and try to cancel it out. And, uh, you, you know, it's hard to do it completely, but it still works to, to reduce it significantly. All right, moving on to a couple of more wave phenomena. One of these is called refraction, and that is simply that a wave will change direction when it moves from one medium to another. And as I mentioned, all of these things happen with all waves. Um, but it's easiest to see with light. Uh, if you have a light wave shining into like a swimming pool, that beam of light won't go straight, it will bend a little bit. And the explanation for why its direction changes, uh, there's, it's because the speed of the wave changes in the different medium. Light travels slower in water, and so that's why it bends a little bit. Uh, here's a couple of kind of analogies. If you have a bunch of soldiers marching in line, <clears throat> Uh, and they're on firm ground here. When they hit the mud, which slows them down a little bit, it causes them to bunch up. Uh, I like this analogy here best, actually. If you have a barrel rolling on <clears throat> some smooth surface, and then it hits a less smooth surface here, the end that hits the grass first is going to slow down, whereas this end is going to move faster for a little bit longer, and so that causes it to change direction. If the barrel were going the other direction, you'd have the exact opposite effect, where this end would speed up first, and it would also bend direction, but instead of uh, moving toward the 
the line perpendicular to the interface, it would move away from the line perpendicular or the normal. All right. Um, and if you are shining a flashlight into water, you actually get several effects. You get this ray that goes in here that's refracted, and that's also considered a transmission of a wave. And then you get one that will bounce off, and that's a reflected ray, and that one will bounce off at the same angle because of the law of reflection. If you're shining it a light from the water, you get a reflected ray back into the water, and then you get this one that's refracted, this transmitted refracted ray out. And this causes some interesting optical effects. If you've ever looked, you probably didn't stick a straw or a, a pencil in a beaker, more likely you've had a straw in a glass of water. But if you ever noticed, it looks kind of funny at the boundary there. And the reason for that is because of refraction. The light leaving the pencil in the water bends and looks like it's coming from a different place than it actually is. Uh, here is some geeky physics teacher who used some, got the angles just right to make a really good effect here. Okay. Um, or maybe if you have a fish tank, if you've noticed, if you look on the corner on the edge of, a, of your tank, it looks like the same fish is on both sides there. And what's going on is the fish is actually located here, and the light bends as it comes out, but we perceive the light as having come from here and here. So those are all uh, effects of refraction. Okay, almost done here. Uh, diffraction. This is the last one we're going to look at. We're not really going to do any calculations with this, uh, but I do want you to be familiar with what it is. And it's simply that waves bend around obstacles. And so here's a little block in some water. And so these waves, they bend around. You do get what's called a shadow region here where it blocks the waves. But if they didn't bend at all, that shadow region would just be like perfectly, a, a perfect rectangle going on forever where the waves just were stopped. But they do kind of bend around and eventually come back together. And <clears throat> the amount of diffraction or the size of the shadow region does depend on the size of the object, the obstruction, uh, compared to the size of the wavelength. So if the obstruction is small compared to the wavelength, you don't get much of a shadow region. If it's a little bit bigger, you get a little shadow region, and if it's a lot bigger, you get a real big shadow region. If you make your wavelength longer, then again, it shrinks that shadow region. So those things are taking into account. Um, and this is why you can hear people around a corner. If there was no diffraction, the waves couldn't bend around a corner. But because the wavelength of light is so much smaller than the wavelength of sound, that's why sound doesn't diffract around a corner, or sorry, light doesn't diffract around a corner very much. So you can't see around the corner, but you can hear around the corner. And that's due to the differences in their wavelengths. OK, so we went over quite a lot. Just to summarize, here are the five phenomena that I want you to be familiar with. Waves bounce off things. They can travel through things. Uh, they interfere with each other, either growing larger or canceling out. They can change direction when they go from one medium to another. And they can bend around obstacles. Um, for our calculations, we're mostly going to calculate off standing waves. But I do want you to be familiar with these phenomena. Um, all right, that's all. Have a nice day.